Uh, also, I'm a 22 Nuffield Scholar. Not too sure what I was thinking about, but this last summer I decided to apply for the scholarship that's based out of the UK, and it's actually a worldwide network of crazy ag enthusiasts that like to try silly things. So it's like it's almost like a support group, like <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous or something. So so I have to announce to everybody that I'm a 22 scholar. It's actually been a pretty fun experience. Some of my comments that I made earlier about ag policy. I just made a trip to Europe um, in March. It was my first little kick at the cat. The Nuffield Scholarship is really about, you know, you go on, you pick a study topic and you travel the world. So I have 10 weeks of travel. Uh, Farming Smarter has been kind enough to support it as well. And Alberta Wheat Commission is, uh, is my sponsor for the year. But while I was in Europe, it was pretty eye-opening to see how ridiculous ag policy can completely perturb uh, a farming system. And that's exactly why you see things like what's happening in Holland right now, Sri Lanka and things like that. So it's sort of raised, if anything, it's, it's got me a little bit more passionate about how we need to all be doing our best at informing good policy with science. And the science piece is the part that always gets missed. So that's, that's just a little bit of a background on, on what's going on. When I give my talks, like really what I, I love agronomy, this is what makes, gets me excited and passionate about agronomy. I'd like this to be as much as a conversation, a discussion as possible. I think we were even having some discussions at the table. If there was any confusion over the information from the last trials, this is a great time to bring it back up and, and we'll talk it through. We don't have the answers to everything, but we do have the opportunity to test a lot of crazy different things. That's what this trial is behind me. This is our irrigated Durham trial and I'm, I'm really happy that Dave's here because Dave may not know this but he was the inspiration for this particular research trial. Did you know that Dave? There's a song, You're My Inspiration, I'll sing it to you later. Yeah. Anyway, so Dave, Dave came to me one day and you know he's been a field boss, did you say over 40 years now? 30. 30? Okay, well I added an extra 10 on there just for... Makes a good story. Makes a good story, yes. <laughs> So he came to me one day and he goes, Ken, you know, we haven't been able to increase Durham yields in 20 years. And yeah, you do know this because we brought it up at other tops. Because then he came back, he said, you know what, Ken? We're doing better on Durham. So, so how come you're doing better on Durham? What, what was the things you were doing different? Growth regulators. Growth regulators. Yeah, Isn't that interesting? So happens that we have growth regulators in this trial. So one of the things that we wanted to do was look at the agronomy of crop production. So that's really like, how do we manipulate the things that we do to maximize the chances of optimum yields for, for production? And while the planter is just like, yeah, we've got this planter, so we're just gonna try everything with it. But when you talk about corn production, those guys are always looking at the architecture of the crop, the distribution of the crop within the field, you know, if, if we have a big crowd here and everybody gets together and we put our hands out and we have, like, it's like COVID, right? It's, we have to have the perfect six feet of separation between all of us. That's what they're looking for in corn because you don't want to have a lot of tillers. You just want to have basically one cob per corn and that's how they're getting 350 bushels of corn. We don't tend to do that in our cereal production, but guess what? A cereal, is corn a cereal? It is, isn't it? It's a funny looking cereal, but it's still a cereal. So the principles here were, let's see if we can manipulate some of the canopy structure using a precision planter, using a couple of different growth um, seeding rates. But on top of that, we layered growth regulators and we layered fungicide applications and we layered nutrient content. So we went with sort of your base fertility and then a maximum fertility, which is basically just 50% more, more nitrogen. So under irrigation, we have the benefit of pushing the yield boundaries. I believe that when we're in higher yielding environments, whether it's here or, or say up into Edmonton, where they've got black soil and more rain and higher yield potential in that regard, that's where those little differences really can add up. We get all excited about doing that under our dryland grain production, but what's our limiting factor in, in dryland crop production? H2O. H2O. Imagine that. And then when we do get H2O, it comes all at once. So we've, we've got pretty tough environment here. So what, what we found so far, and I'm not going to go through the, the results 
in anything, but generally speaking, with all of our planter work, our germination is always better. Why do you think that is? Precision depth and uh, soil seed contact. And seed to soil contact, right depth, right depth and, 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 spacing. and spacing. So everybody understands how the planter works now? Okay. I, I think one of the other things that you know we kind of touched on there is that a planter has its depth control exactly where the seed's coming out. In our air drills, where where's the depth control? Way behind. It's usually usually way behind on the packer wheel, right? Yeah. So it doesn't have the same amount of time to respond to the changes in land. Like you can you can sometimes uh, this is probably a little bit deep, but you can sometimes take a planter, it'll actually go into that pivot track, and you'll have stuff growing, whereas if you went with a drill, there's no way to do that. So independent depth control, I think, is a really important part. Okay, so has anybody seen, ah, what the heck is that guy's name, Phil? Phil Needham? Phil Needham's work? So what does he talk about usually? All the basic stuff, uh, seat depth, seat rates. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and minimum tillering. So he talks about tillering. Let's everybody come in a little closer and we'll, we'll do some experiments here. So the reason he talks about minimum tillering is, and, and you'll see that, when you've, have you guys heard these talks of the record yield breakers in, in wheat? They're usually from New Zealand or something like that. Yeah. They always talk about we're going to work backwards in the crop. We're going to say, what I'm looking for is so many heads per meter squared. Have you guys ever thought about how many, how many heads per meter squared are you looking for, Will, when you're, when you're growing something? Uh, I'm going to guess 400. But... <laughs> yeah, but we don't tend to think that way, right? I think that's what they do. So, so that's what's interesting about this trial. So what do we have here? We've got 300 seeds per meter squared with normal fertilizer. And this is with a planter. So if you want to come in and look, let's look at the, the actual rows. So you can see how they're kind of spaced out. Looks pretty even. George, do you want to dig up a plant at the front so I don't get in trouble for wrecking the trial? Oh, I thought you wanted this for digging yourself into a hole. No, no, this is for second place in a shovel fight, George. All right. Let's see what he was asking to go for. <laughs> How's that? There's a chunk. Why don't you try to break break it out and hand it around and, and let people see how many count tillers on here. Okay. Count some tillers, Tom. Dave, count some tillers. And some more over here. How many tillers? Have you ever seen everybody knows what a tiller is, right? I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. What do you think happens with seeding rate and tillering? As you go higher seeding rate, what happens to tillering? Reduced. Go down. Exactly. Less tillering. So why do you think that is? Sunlight. Lack of sunlight at the growing crop. Nutrients. Mm -hmm. Nitrogen especially. Yeah. So it's kind of interplant competition. We always think about weed competition, but we're talking about interplant competition now. What do we have for tillers there? How many tillers? Well, it depends on the plant. This one, one three. Is probably on the edge of have more. Yeah. But on average. One, one tiller over here. Dave, what you got? One tiller. One. One tiller. You might have to break that off. It looks like. And then there's some that are being sloughed. There's other ones. That... Yeah. So you have a tiller that starts, but it doesn't want to make it. Yeah. Right. It's, it's dying off. Okay. Yeah. So in the corn growing belt, they've they figured out that actually one main stem plant is what they're after here. With wheat, maybe one tiller might be a good target. So when we're looking at heads, I was just talking with the, the European fellow that Carlo had mentioned, or Mike had mentioned, Chris, they're actually targeting like 800 heads per meter squared. Right now, like you said, even if you seeded at 300 meters per square and you got one tiller, that would be 600 heads, right? So obviously they're in a higher yielding environment, but if we start trying to figure out and manipulating the environment to figure out what's the best amount of heads per meter squared, the best amount of tillers, then we can kind of work backwards. So 
you know we're not going to hit that at this seeding rate. So maybe now we have to look at higher seeding rates. So the group went by and actually counted the heads per meter squared on this plot. I said planter, normal fertility with none. We're about 225 heads per meter squared here. So Make sense? Put however yeah. you need to a good crop. Well, according to them, but our yield potential is probably not as high as theirs is, right? Yeah, but we have no lack of water. Not right now. You're nope. irrigated, so right? So. Yep. So come in and actually take a look. Take a look at the arc, you know, arc, take a look at how the plant distribution is. I actually it's want nice. everybody to go in there and take a look. I'm not moving on until somebody moves. But Ken. And you guys are going to have to start Ken. asking questions too. Ken, roll with. What's your roll with here? Okay. The question is roll with. We're on a 12 inch row spacing. Is that what we should be at? Now George is asking if are we on the right row spacing? What do you guys think? No, probably not. Irrigation should be less. What do you think we should be at? Six, five. Six. So if we're talking about world record yield in New Zealand, it is five, six inches. We went to a zero till production system. What do you think happened to row spacing then? It had to go wider so you can plant. We had to go wider, and we did that for logistic reasons, right? We did it for horsepower. We did it for cost. We did it for residue flow. Um, remember, all of these world records are all under complete tillage. They just beat the heck out of the soil and then seed narrow row and they got really high seeding densities. What do you think happens to tillering when you go to a wider row with the same seeding rate? More tillers. I think it'd be the opposite. It's more, oh, it's no, more dense. No. Yeah. Again, sorry. More plants per row there. That's right. So if you go to a wider row with the same seeding rate, you have more plants in that row, more interplant competition. competition. So yeah. the, space, That's right. the spacing that causes or allows for tillery is not between the row, but between the plants. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So we're kind of at a difficult situation with small seeds. You know, when we're, we're talking about corn, we're putting down 30,000 kernels per acre. When we're talking about wheat, and this is a conversation, this is how they speak when, when we're talking planter talk. It's like baby talk. It's a totally different way of talking. Like you were even mentioning how many inches between the plant. That's, that's how they speak. We don't do that when it comes to small grains. What do you, how many seeds per acre do you think we're putting down with? 1.8 million. Okay, that's right. So we're at one over a million seeds per acre. So that level of distribution that we can achieve in a small grain versus a corn obviously isn't possible. Um, but you know, you think of the concepts of tiller management, row spacing, all of the influences that we have on tillering, where do you think the best optimum row spacing would be? I mean, I think there's a, I don't think we have to go back to a four and a five inch row spacing to achieve good yields because that compromise that we made under zero tillage was offset by something. And what was that limiting factor that we always have? Moisture. 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 Absolutely. So, so that's something to keep in mind and I think that that even holds true under irrigation because one of the worst things that we have to contend with here in southern Alberta is what? Wind. 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 What does the wind do? And there's a fancy little term we like to talk about. Evapotranspiration. Yeah. So the evapotranspiration potential in southern Alberta often exceeds the amount of precipitation that we have. So if we want to reduce evapotranspiration, having that nice residue cover over the soil is one of the best things that we can do. But we have it in our head that we have irrigation and water isn't limiting. I'm sorry, water is still limiting. So I do believe, yes, narrower rows will give you the higher yields, but we're also in an environment where we have to manage evapotranspiration. So I, it, it might not actually be five or, or six inches as optimum. It might be more like eight or nine or 10. A lot of research has been done in row spacing in the past, but what we haven't done is sort of layered it back into this advanced agronomy. So this is what this trial is, is a bit of an opportunity to play around with some different scenarios. Yes. So Ken, so when you have years ago you had plots here where I believe it was 10, 8, 10 and 12 
row spacings, and then you were playing with two inch spoons and three inch spoons. You remember that one? I'm old. Holy and shit. <laughs> The, Does I your wanna, CCA number start with a one or a two? It, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm curious about is uh, the data versus what you're doing here now going in a single row. What were you seeing? What's the biggest change? I mean, this is going to limit you going with fertilizer. You're in a single row. The spoons at one time, you know, you could pair the row up and you could kind of blast whatever yeah. you wanted. Because there's still a lot of two inch and three inch spoons out there. Yeah. But Doug, at the same time now, most of our nitrogen is put down mid row, right? So it really doesn't. Well, if you have mid row banners, not everyone yeah. does. That's where every situation is different. And the best we can do is, is sort of look for combinations of approaches that will sort of give you the best probability of success. Because on the flip side, if you're going dry land, and I think I saw this conversation on, on Twitter, and the question was, along the lines of what would do better in drought scenarios. What do you guys now think? Wide row versus narrow? Wide, wide. Little wider. I little think wider. The irrigation and, and the dry land, I think they're quite separate. You, I, yeah. mean, I know I've seen one of the, some of our best crops come out of a thin sand that looked like it should be worked under in the spring and in the fall you yeah. just scratch your head. On, dr on dry land. On dry land. Yes. On dry land. Or in drought conditions. That's why yeah. I'm saying they should get, there's a diff big difference there. Well, there is, a, but there's there's connections. Yeah. But the thing is you if you go narrow rows of higher populations in dry land, you run out of moisture, all that moisture is sucked out trying to grow the plant. Yes. And there's yeah. nothing there to fix <coughs> So in a dry land scenario, do you want tillers or not? Yeah. Probably not. I think probably not. I think a main stem is going to be more suited to extract as much moisture as possible. So I would say a wider row, but you have to make sure that you actually even reduce probably the seeding rate. Because if you have too many seeds in that row, now you've got in too much inter-row plant competition. But there, there, there is, that's the thing is, how do you know what the right combination of agronomic practices are under each condition? It gets pretty complicated. Every year is different. This yeah. year when we had a cool spring, the guys that were actually moving some dirt, yeah. two inch spoons, three inch spoons, that crop was out of the ground before it okay. started So I'm glad you mentioned that because that's where one of the confusion was that we had in the previous conversations. The, the study that you were talking about, we were looking at ESN. That was when ESN first came out. So we were looking at seed safety and how much fertilizer you can put down. So when you have a spoon, say a three inch spoon, or spreader tip on a 10 inch roll space and 30% seed bed utilization. You can actually get away with almost all of your nitrogen in a single roll and not damage the crop. So then we were playing around with what would ESN do and, and comparatively. Um, that's, that's sort of beside the point, but I wanted to bring back that concept of seed bed utilization and how it safens the seed with fertilizer. If it safens the seed for fertilizer, it probably gives a little more space for the crops too. So now you have a little less interplant competition, a little more access to resources. But I think the layering effect that we've seen this year is also what I talked about, is that a three inch spoon isn't all that different from a strip till. It's just, it's, it's the same concept, really, is that that little bit of tillage is loosening up that hard compacted baked soil that we have and allows capillary action so that the moisture comes up and you get decent germination. So. You may see the advantage to germination, but if your plant population, you know, isn't fed properly throughout the growing season, does it result in a higher yield or not? And that's, that's also tricky. That but, you, but again, it goes back to your question about tillering and dry land. How do you regulate them under tillers when you're seeding to make sure you don't have one more than one or two to maintain any of your moisture and all these other good things? Well, I think that's where, like, if you're from foremost and you're used to certain number of years and that type of growing condition. That's where farmers adapt their own farming practices to work best in most cases throughout their year. But in other cases, they have to, they can't just follow that same rule, right? If you, if you more often than not will have a little more moisture or a little less wind and all that sort of stuff, the farmers are pretty good at adapting to find their own um, sort of right approach that manages risk while optimizing yield. And there's even a difference amongst varieties. You Absolutely. Barley, come yeah. along, you know you have to see it. It's a very good yeah. dry, dry barley. You come up with the weight. Mm -hmm. It hardly it does very little tillering. You have to seed it at a higher rate than, for example, the old variety Xena. 
it's yeah. somehow really adjusted to the condition. But con law, you have to. So it's a really great comment, Dave, and I'm, you should come to all of our tours. Okay. <laughs> One of, one of the risk management strategies that we're actually looking at putting a new proposal in is that exact thing, um, is, is looking at mixes of varieties. So, you know, if you do have a planter or if you just, you know, if you have an air seeder, you can, you can blend varieties. And then given the conditions that you have, maybe one variety does better in the drought, one variety does better under humid. So, so that's something we're actually interested in looking into. And, and yes, you'll notice that certain varieties will have differences. Is there a way of sort of managing risk by putting them together? There might even be some fungicide issues. So it, we don't know the answers to any of that, but so yeah, Tom. Go, okay, just, so we're going to go back to 40, 50 years ago. I grew up in the farm in Ontario. We grew mixed grain. Yeah. Oats, barley, Possibly. and wheat. All oh, really? Them, all three of Crop them. Crop types. Yeah. For, for feed? For feed. You can for get feed. away for feed, but, yeah. and then I suppose if you had seed cleaners, I mean, yeah. there's more. Yeah. More but I mean, the, the, the th thinking was is parts of the field that weren't drained as well as others, so some yeah. would do better. That sort of stuff. Was some had better salinity tolerance to yeah. others. Yeah. So some some wheat varieties are actually called a varietal blend as well. Um, so like anything with a VB, it, it's, it's a different variety. So they do that for midge management. It's midge stewardship usually, but it's not intended for agronomy in in that sense. Tom, just a short comment. You know, you you said like corn. There's there's been more agronomy work done on corn than any other crop, but you know, not only are they variable rate seeding rates in a the field, they are going now yep. to variable rate varieties. Varieties, yeah. yeah. So they, they do do a lot more precision ag type work along that front, where they'll test different varieties and find that one variety performs better in one part of the field. So just a comment on mixing varieties or whatever. Greg Stamps tells me when he tries new varieties. Mm -hmm. Highest yield will always be when he, the seed he got left over from the varieties, you mix them together, it always have the highest yield with a mixed blend. No kidding. Yeah, that's what it does. Well, that's good news and good, good news for the funders to hear that too. So when our proposal shows up, they take interest. I think you had another comment? Oh, just on, as we're trying to increase our, our head population per square meter, we also need to adjust our fertility rates as well to, to support the yield we're trying to get, right? Yeah. So, so if you're under irrigation and water isn't as limiting as it would be in dry land, then you can afford to do that sort of stuff. And I think, exactly, right? And the, the unfortunate part is, is that under irrigation, we tend to focus on our most money-making crops, right? So all of the agronomy goes to potatoes. No offense, Scott. But, <laughs> but you know, you got pretty damn expensive land. You're only growing potatoes one in four every five years looking at these very important crops in between, I think there actually is a lot of opportunity to offer a game. Do you have some? I was just going to mention too, like <clears throat> what Doug was talking about with that, like a little bit of tillage or a tillage. Yes. Because <clears throat> um, Rob Dunn had did that talk at the Medicine Hat mm -hmm. conference in 2020. Right before COVID, yeah. Right before COVID, yeah. I always remember that because it's the very last one. <laughs> yeah, it was. But he had talked about how when they got really ultra, ultra low disturbance and they had problems with with uh, what they think was Roundup or something, yes. just inhibiting yep. growth. And I actually did see that one one year yep. uh, in, actually it was quinoa, but it was the same thing. Interesting. Where, where it was, yep. so even just that, just a little tiny bit of disturbances can help with all, with Safety that too. So, that yep. Yeah. But is that short term? If we keep loading our soils with glyphosate, is that gonna catch us eventually? I, I just think, question. I think, well, I think he, I think his, I think what he was thinking was that it's a slow accumulation in the duff layer in or the that, residue in the residue yeah. and so when you're when you get that really nice system where you've got that really nice residue and holding in the moisture well you're actually yeah that was one yeah. of the unintended yeah. things but, that but at the same time you also look at what kind of uh, uh, cropping conditions that that research is done and it was done with stripper header stuff so there's a whole lot of residue it yeah, was it's a big it, difference yeah it's they, a they huge were, difference yeah, yeah. No, but they, i mean they were kind of going where mm -hmm. They were trying to do what they really thought was going to be the best thing was yep. have a nice cover and you'd have this great system but it, then it shows the importance of not not only just managing regional differences but system differences because yep. there's really a different system there um when you have a duff layer like this and you know like they've all of the rules that we've created like seeding early sometimes like canola they're like no we're not seeding early with canola because we've learned that we need a little more time we don't have the same soil temperatures but it's, it's a slower start but it ends up uh, excelling because of the moisture conservation. I thought I saw another comment here. Yeah. 
So um, my question is, um, I have several questions. So first one is, um, when was the PGR applied to the durum? Mm -hmm. And then the second one, I, I'm more concerned about the soil health. And then um, the Dutch have an adage which says, uh, fertilizers are good for the fathers and bad for the sons and then grandsons. So um, in as much as we have um, uh, irrigation here, I would like to know um, what is the as normal application of fertilizer in um, Leadbridge, and mm -hmm. then what is the maximum one that you applied on this drum? Yeah, um, is Mike here? Ditch me. <laughs> so, normal fertilizer under irrigation for wheat, we're usually hitting in between 100 and 150 pounds of nitrogen. So the 50% range is 50% above that. So if normal is 100, we would put 150 pounds of fertilizer for for that. In this case, we're we're looking at extremes. We wanted to have big enough differences that we could actually see an effect. Sometimes we do that in trials, or you don't see the difference. So it's looking at a response curve. The PGRs are normally applied at that growth stage 32. Why don't we use that opportunity to move? Because I hate standing in the same spot for too long. Mm -hmm. So let's 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 just look here and, and you guys can find a plot that looks shorter <coughs> and we'll stop and talk about it. Here, I'll do. Yeah. So you only have one time here or two or twice for that? Just one time on the PJ. You know what I'm gonna Yeah. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's skip that one and keep going because then we can look at more than one thing. Did anything catch your eye here? You want to go back? Which one? Okay, well, we've moved into the half seeding right now. So this one does have the growth regulator and a fungicide. Actually doesn't look wonderful, does it? Looks pretty thin. Yeah. Thailand's be okay, but... So I think, I think what we're seeing right away is, yeah, the canopy didn't clo close over as much. We now have weed comp or weeds that are still able to, to grow. Can I get you to dig up a few plants on the 150s now? We're here, right in the front, or is Does that, that say 150? That's just 150, yeah. Yeah, that'll work. Is it planter? Yep. Yeah, dig some up there. Well, it's not it's perfectly placed, it's per something placed. I'm not yeah. sure how that, that word is. But you don't want me to do it from there, right? Because you're a measure? Or? Yeah, go from the front. Yeah. yeah. And there's also 150. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there's a whole bunch that are 150. I think at the front of the plots, we're actually seeing effect from last year's um, windrow from wherever the combine went. So the growth regular, you can see, really does, that's a pretty dramatic Cancel. drop in height there. It doesn't change the biomass, but what's neat about growth regulators that I've learned fairly recently is that they can actually be used for tiller management as well, and they can enhance root growth. So if you if you're doing it at the right time, you can you can you can have an influence on how many tillers there are. It doesn't change the biomass; it just makes it shorter and then thicker cell walls. So it, it gives you stronger straw and less less chance of lodging, but. Um, it still actually can have an impact, not just because of the reduction in lodging, but because of the, the canopy, the effects in the canopy structure, as well as the, the root growth impact. So that's part of why I think the growth regulators are, are helping us under irrigation. What do you want to play with this? What are you using, Ken? Which I think we have manipulator on this one. Okay. Yeah. Ken, if I may, Dave mentioned something at the very beginning we asked him what it be different. He said that he got 25 bushels more because he was using a growth regulator. Yeah. I want to clarify that one. Were you getting more because you could harvest it, or was there actually more you, you grain could, in the field? You could push. You could push it harder with water and fertility. Okay. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, if you don't use a grow dirt, there's a fine okay. line. When should I stop irrigating? If it's seed too thick, it goes down. If you irrigate too long, and then yeah. if it goes but down too early, it just bends over. And the point I'm making is a growth regulator does not increase actual yield. It might increase harvestable yield. I think it does both. You think so? Yeah, we've seen the data that even with when lodging is not an impact, it can have a positive impact in yield. It's not going to be as much. So a small gain in, in 
And we've seen that statistically any, proven. And any idea yeah. how that works? I think it actually might have something to do with its impacts on the roots, not the top. Okay. Fair enough. So, so that's what I've been learning lately, and we're still trying to figure that out. How many tillers do we have on there? Is that what you're pointing at? No, Kabir was going to say something. Oh, oh, I was just going to say that it also probably reduces just the vegetative growth, which can sometimes help with the yield. Yeah. So Kabir said it sometimes can reduce vegetative growth so that more energy goes to the grain. Yeah. It definitely sets it back, I mean, probably pretty much a week, five, six days. It, it's it's going to be later. Yeah. I don't know. we got enough growing days here. It, uh, mm -hmm. For us, it's been a, a big advantage. Go ahead. Um, sure. Your fungicide application, was it like flag leaf timing or head timing and which product? I think it's flag leaf timing and... Flails late flag leaf early... Procero? Uh, yes, it's Procero. Procero. Yeah. So, I'm glad you brought that question up though, because one of the things that I'm interested in using precision planters as an agronomic tool is that if we have a plot or a field now that has one tiller and one main stem, you tend to flower more evenly all at the same time. So in particular, Durham is a little bit weaker on Fusarium head blight. So if we can have a, a really nice even field, I think we'll get a more effective job done with uh, a fungicide used for head blight management in particular. So in this case, we didn't apply it at the, head, at the fungus, um, the timing, but it's just something that on the side note that I'm also interested in. I think anytime we can have a more even crop, all of our agronomic decisions are a little bit easier. Growth regulator is another good good example. So if we're, you know, in this case, manipulator is pretty safe on the crop, but some of the growth regulators, you know, if you get at the wrong stage, you can actually hurt the crop. So a nice even stand uh, gives you a, a better opportunity for getting it sprayed at the proper stage. The other benefit is harvest management. So when we come into harvest time, a more even crop, better for desiccation. So if you have low spots that aren't ready at the same time, so, so that's, that's going to help even all of that sort of stuff out. That's where taking this, you know, what the sort of the best of what we learn of this huge trial, like there's 27 treatments here, but if we take the best of what we're learning and then take it to the next step using the field tested program, doing some field tested trials, then we can start to pick up on some of those benefits. And, you know, being able to, if we have to desiccate, the desiccate timing is better. And then you're, you're going to have a more even crop to harvest. And I think that might actually even have impacts on storage management too, because a lot of times we're going in there, if you've got a lot of greens, you know, and we see this in hail, right? If you have a hail damaged crop, you're going to start seeing tillers, right? The plant's natural response to a stress. And, and now you're going to have green seeds mixed and now you have storage issues. So all of that evenness that we can do to get, you know, a, a better crop, I think has a lot of ramifications. Um, so so that's, that's sort of an interesting part of, of this study. So I have a question, yeah. Ken. Um, maybe today I, I'm kind of asking you more questions. So, That's okay. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, does um, PGL and then the fungicide pay dividend? Does it pay? Well, the trial's still out. Uh, uh, David, um, can you answer? Because you, you said um, you applied the PGL and then um, you had uh, what, 15 or something percent yield. Looking at the labor hours that you came to apply the PGL, uh, the PGL has an input that you bought, and then looking at the total harvest yield and then um, the profits as well, does that pay? Well, for 20, 20 years we were at the plateau. We couldn't go higher than between 100 and 112 bushels on the dirt because lodging was always the limiting factor. Now with the road regulation, you can push the water longer and, uh, and more fertility and we are up to 130, 135 bushes now. So it pays, first of all, harvestability, it pays in spades. Well, I mean the yeah. cash, the it income cost, of a fee. Well, it, it costs about $18 to put it on and we have our own sprayer. Or e even guys are putting it on with the airplane having a decent success. So 25 bushes, last year it was $20 a bushel, which is $500 an acre. The product costs, uh, let's see, let's say 20. The plane would cost 12, so that is uh, $32, and we, we get a five point. Like it was extreme, it was really yeah. high there. So $470 return per acre on that 
extreme example. Yeah. Extreme example. <laughs> but even at, even okay. at eight dollars a bushel. Okay, so his his question was, does it pay? This is um, we haven't completed this study, but if you look at the, I think it's the second last page on the handout where we are seeing the yield advantage is with the growth regulator and fungicide combined. Question on that, there was, are there other factors as well, like different varieties of herb, or are you still growing AC strong? For this growing? is all the no. same same variety. In our yeah. case, you, you pick the best variety for standing. We're using strong gold. Yeah. To yeah. Try to start so to up with the with a good strong variety. Mm -hmm. so, so there are other factors as well. It's not yes. the same variety of durum. So you, you've changed varieties yeah. which are higher yielding, the bred well, for higher yielding yeah. as well. So it's not yeah. maybe there, just there a migrator. Some yeah. Higher yielding variety high yielding yeah. variety out there, but for lodging you or yeah. you try to uh, get choose the get best the one. Best so if I threw in a variety thing here then the trial would be from here all the way back <laughs> to the uh, the church there. So we do we do have to sort of choose our focus yeah. and learn what we learn and then if, and, and sort of take what we learn and then expand on that so we never can answer all of the questions in fact when we do this we end up creating more questions than anything um, but that is sort of the the value of doing this type of work yeah ken i'm just giving you more good ideas exactly yes yes and, and i have the money too so okay yeah. we'll send it your way I, we heard that you said you could yeah. send the money yeah. so i guess i'm out of time Thank you very much. I really appreciate the fact that you guys honestly engaged in the conversation. That made it a lot more fun for me and I hope for you guys too. The, the long and um, sort of the take homes from here is we can start thinking about tiller management. We can start thinking about row spacing. How we distribute and manage these crops does have an impact. And even in our study so far, we've seen a difference of almost 40 bushels an acre from the lowest treatment to the highest. And I'm not here as a planter salesman, but most of the high ones came from the planter. So that tells me that we should be thinking more about how we're treating and placing these seeds. Make sense? Yep. All right, get on the trailer. Thanks, Big guys. round of applause.